What about for? Well, it was an odd journey. I'd always written. I always run one prizes for writing. I loved to do it. I also loved acting and uh, singing and dancing. And they were easy for me. And if it was easy for me, it had to be crap. <laughs> now, you may understand that. If something comes native to you and it's not a struggle to do it, then it doesn't really matter. And I've known a lot of people who are gifted artists uh, or gifted actors or musicians. And because it was easy for them, they said it's not really important. And uh, of course, my mother had something to do with that. When I was nine years old, she said, happy birthday, you're nine. Lauren Mizell is nine, and he's conducting the New York Philharmonic. <laughs> so I was no a pressure. bum at nine. <laughs> so anything that came easy, I shouldn't be doing. And because my father died when I was young, and my mother, who was an opera singer and a concert pianist, had to become a piano teacher, a high-paying specialty, <laughs> she said, you need something to fall back on. So I chose architecture, supposedly a wedding between art and science. I found out later it was a shotgun wedding, and neither party wanted to be there. <laughs> but I read The Fountainhead. If anybody knows that book by Ayn Rand, and I thought, if I'm an architect, I'm going to get laid a lot. <laughs> and then I showed up at the Department of Architecture at Carnegie Tech, and the only woman I met was Andy Warhol's mother, who was the cleaning lady. That was it. So that ended the dream. <laughs> but I did become an architect. Anyway, I found out later I always had something to fall back on. It, it's my ass. And when I fall back on it, I get up. So finally, I decided I had two kids. They were brilliant. I'm working seven days a week as an architect. I'm the chief designer and field supervisor for a medium-sized Pittsburgh firm, 80 draftsmen. And at the same time, I'm working my own architectural practice. And I'm getting GSA work, which is government work, post office. Not exciting, but I couldn't clear 10 grand a year. And I thought, how am I going to get my brilliant kids educated? I'll write, which was really incredibly dumb. But it suddenly <laughs> occurred to me, I'll, I'll write for a living. I'll make a fortune. So luckily, there was a comedian coming through Pittsburgh named Shelley Berman. Only those of you who are really ancient will know that I name. But he was a big star. And I had met him in summer stock because I would go to summer stock as an actor and scene designer. I later got my ticket as a scene designer and worked for Broadway designers. But I convinced him he knew me. And I said, I think I can write for you. He says, nobody can write for me, Schmuck. Nobody. I said, well, give me a shot. What's he said, all right. He gave me his address. I wrote some stuff and sent it to him. Three weeks later, he calls and he says, Schmuck, you can do this. <laughs> Yeah, come to New York, I'll get you an agent. I'm at the Perry Como show. So I go to New York to the Perry Como show, and I go to Shelley. I said, Shelley, I'm Ron Friedman. He says, I'm having a nervous breakdown. I'm going to Jamaica. I can't talk to you. I said, I came in from Pittsburgh. He said, it'll be there when you return. <laughs> I'm standing there worried because I was going to take this shot, and my fraternity brother, Gary Smith, turned out to be the designer for the Como show. And he came over and he said, did you bring material? I said, yeah, I got a bunch. He said, give it to me. I'll give it to the head writer, Goodman Ace, an old hallowed name as a writer for radio and early television. So Gary took me to lunch while Goodman Ace read my material. When I came back, Ace said, come with me. He takes me to the writer's room and he points. He said, if any of these Jews die, I'll give you a job. <laughs> <laughs> He said, he said, but I don't have enough money in the budget to hire you now, so come on to William Morris. I'll get Larry R. back to sign you. So that's what I did. I sold my practice for $11, and for, my wife then said to me, I'm going to my mother's in Virginia, and I'm taking the children. If you make a living, let me know. So the first three months were difficult, and they said, they looked at my plays and said, no, no, you're funny. You're going to write stand-up. So I worked for stand-up comics playing toilets. Toilets is a term of art. It means a low place. Comedy clubs now are classy. If you're not funny, they still laugh. They don't want to embarrass you. But nightclubs, you weren't funny, they throw ashtrays at you. And the front tables always had mafia guys and hookers who are not noted for their subtlety. Anyway, so I learned to write the hard way. And the deal was this. I would write for a comic. And they'd say, it's not funny. I'd say, it's funny. They'd say, you do it. So I appeared at the Club Elegant in Brooklyn, upstairs at the Duplex, the Neville Lee in the Catskills, 
I would do my material, I'd get big laughs, they'd have to pay me. And one thing led to another, and then Danny Kay, if anybody knows Danny Kay, he saw something I'd written, and he said, you're coming to California. I said, under no circumstances. I've been there. I don't like it. Anyway, here I am, 112 years later. <laughs> you know, I lucked out. Wow. That's amazing. Thanks, guys. Sure. Thanks.